Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Clinical Journal Club. We cover two weeks this session. Uh, this image in the New England Journal shows a 22-year-old man who presented with palpitations and chest discomfort. On examination, he has a mid-systolic click. Um, that is actually fairly diagnostic for mitral valve prolapse. And of these things that are offered here, the only thing that would fit would be redundant mitral valve, which is another expression for mitral valve prolapse. And if we look at this mitral valve shown on this echocardiographic image, it certainly fits with that diagnosis. So that's the correct diagnosis, redundant mitral valve. Uh, this patient eventually required surgery and uh, did well. Uh, here's some additional information on how this, how this works. Uh, this is the redundant mitral valve. And if, if we look at this, this drawing here, we can see that it fits very well with the echocardiographic image that we saw in that uh, New England Journal. The first topic at the New England Journal two weeks ago was uh, smallpox. This is historically a devastating disease. Uh, first of all, the mortality is about 30%, and the other is uh, the remarkably uh, severe disfiguration that these patients suffered, as we can see from this small child who had smallpox. Notice that the distribution of the pox is uh, actually more peripheral in the face, and the thorax and abdomen are relatively spared compared to chicken pox, which is the other way around. Chicken pox, the lesions go away. Smallpox star scars stay forever. Smallpox was supposed to have been eliminated <coughs> from the planet, uh, making the previous smallpox vaccinations that I still had irrelevant. Uh, but it might be that smallpox will come back because apparently the stores nation, uh, worldwide were not eliminated and molecular biological techniques nowadays would uh, uh, allow laboratories to reproduce smallpox since the DNA sequence is known even uh, without having these samples that are probably still someplace in storage. Now, the old smallpox vaccine was a live vaccine <coughs> from um, <coughs> cowpox. And uh, that vaccine had to take, which means that the people that were vaccinated developed a particular pustule uh, to indicate that they would subsequently be immune. And they have a resultant scar where this vaccination was performed. Now, the idea in this study is to develop a new vaccine, which has been done. And this vaccine is not really dead, but it's not really alive either. Uh, this vaccine does not replicate in human cells. That means that when the patients are vaccinated, they don't get this pustule and uh, they don't also get the rare, relatively rare secondary complications uh, that occurred from uh, vaccination with vaccinia. So in this particular study, uh, uh, this new vaccine was tried. And as we can see here, uh, already the peak neutralizing antibody titers were significantly elevated and the vaccinated group didn't get a lesional area compared to the old vaccine. And if we look at the uh, demographics of these individuals, 220 patients in this group, 213 patients in this group, uh, similar kinds of uh, men and women that volunteered for this study, body mass index uh, and uh, size, were in order and uh, the vaccines were applied in, in various ethnic, ethnic subgroups. And what we can see here is the antibody response was uh, very good uh, in the new vaccine and adequate also in the old vaccine, uh, but the lesional diameter was substantially diminished and uh, the vaccine was uh, tolerated in uh, superior manner compared to the old vaccine. So this new vaccine looks like it's going to be effective against smallpox. So if um, smallpox is reintroduced into the population, uh, 
Currently, there is no recommendation for smallpox vaccination in the general public, but this vaccine could then be quickly applied and hopefully then any epidemics would be uh, obviated and avoided. Uh, the next topic at the New England Journal was Bechet's disease. Bechet was a Turkish physician that first described this ulcerating uh, small vessel vasculitis, vasculitis actually, and uh, it involves multiple tissues in the body, uh, involves the eye, the mucous membranes, and uh, can result in a variety of very nasty complications and the condition is difficult to treat. Now, what was done uh, in this uh, particular study was uh, the uh, inhibition of a phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterases deal the, have the purpose of catabolizing cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP. Uh, the most famous phosphodiesterase inhibitor known is, of course, Viagra, which inhibits PDE5. Now, in this particular study, uh, evidence points to the fact that phosphodiesterase 4 is involved here, and uh, this study involves a phosphodiesterase inhibitor in the treatment of Bechet's disease. And the signaling of cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP is important, but it's complicated. It involves protein kinase A and protein kinase G, and a whole variety of endpoints <coughs> result from this signaling, that, including apoptosis, cell motility, cell growth, transcription, platelet aggregation, a whole bunch of things. So in this particular study, uh, the idea was to inhibit this phosphodiesterase 4 in these patients with Bechet's disease. Now, there are 11 families of phosphodiesterases, and the point here was inhibiting phosphodiesterase 4, which is also involved in asthma and some other allergic conditions. So the primary endpoint in the study was the area under the curve for the total number of oral ulcers that these patients had in a 12-week placebo-controlled period with lower in, uh, values indicating fewer ulcers. So this drug is called uh, apremilast, and uh, one possible indication for this uh, compound might be more uh, Bechet's disease. So here we have the patients. There are 103 patients in the placebo group that got usual care, colchicine, glucocorticoids, topical steroids, etc. And uh, the other group got those uh, drugs also, and also received a premolast in the hopes that this would ameliorate this condition. And as we can see, the number of oral ulcers in their surface areas that was measured ended up being only half as large in the premolast group compared to the placebo group, despite the presence of all these other treatments. And this effect was observed within the first week of administration so it looks like a substantial victory for their primalast group compared to placebo. And uh, if we look at secondary endpoints, uh, the time to response and the quality of life and all of these various other things that were measured, uh, inhibiting phosphorylesterase 4 seems to be a reasonable strategy in Bechet's disease. Now, there are some side effects from a premolast, just like there are some side effects from Viagra that nobody wants to talk about. And they included nausea, diarrhea, headache, allegedly some increase in respiratory infection. But these are moderate, uh, these are modest. And if we look at any adverse event, uh, there are 79% compared to 72%. That's not a great difference. Here we have 83% um, compared to 86%. I think we can conclude that a premolast was fairly well tolerated in these patients with Bechet's disease, particularly if they were alleviated of their ulcers. So um, the focus here was on cutaneous ulcers and 56% of the patients had active skin lesions at baseline. The degree, the degree of skin lesions was low and the measures of skin lesions used in the trial were not large enough to detect changes in skin lesions, although I think that the 
mucosal ulcers are the primary problem in patients that have this condition. Now, the review in the New England Journal several weeks ago was on upper airway obstruction. And since this is a, a dramatic problem that clinicians have to deal with, uh, I included uh, some emphasis on this particular review. It used to be that epiglottitis was the primary cause of upper airway obstruction. But since the uh, uh, introduction of a vaccine against Haemophilus influenzae type B, uh, and also um, uh, bacterial causes for epiglottitis, uh, this uh, um, um, Haemophilus influenzae type B is a bacterium. Uh, this uh, complication has decreased dramatically, which is, a, and another treatment that's been introduced is epinephrine auto-injectors in patients that have angioneurotic edema. So the clinical importance of this problem has uh, thankfully decreased in the last 25 years, although it's still important and every physician should have some idea of how to do a tracheostomy uh, if necessary. And if we look at the pathophysiological features and the uh, there's a difference between slub, supraglottic causes and glottic causes or tracheal causes. Um, inspiratory strider, this is primarily an inspiratory problem compared to an expiratory problem that we see in patients with chronic lung disease or asthma. Uh, childhood croup uh, is included in this differential diagnosis and uh, various clinical manifestations are given here. Um, angioedema is still important, particularly as in association with ACE inhibitors and there are various specific treatments for that. Traumatic airway injury, automobile accidents and other causes are, are important that clinicians have to recognize. Uh, there's a supraglottic airway device, which is quite effective uh, that uh, every physician should um, be in a position to apply. And there's also a schematic that's given here uh, of uh, what the physicians are supposed to do. Laryngoscopy, if you have a, an appropriate instrument, tracheal intubation if necessary. Uh, if, that isn't necess if that isn't possible, then this uh, supraglottic airway device, abbreviated SAD, uh, is quite functional and uh, that can be applied uh, face mask ventilation anyway. And if uh, I like the idea about stop and think, uh, consider options before moving to emergency tracheostomy, which uh, is difficult for internists to deal with, but uh, every physician should have an idea on how to do this. And uh, the anatomy is reviewed here and access to the uh, upper airway is shown here. Uh, there are kits, the tools that you need to perform this operation on the sidewalk if need be, and that's what this review is all about. Now, the patient in the New England Journal two weeks ago has hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. And this is a complex clinical condition that, un that fortunately is not very common, but it belongs to hyperinflammatory syndromes that can occur most more commonly in sepsis and conditions of this nature. Um, and um, in this particular example, uh, T cells are involved in the pathogenesis. So what happens here with this massive inflammation, macrophages are activated to the point where they engulf or phagocytize erythrocytes. And that's why this is called hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. That's the topic in this, uh, this uh, patient that I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, this condition was first described by Marilyn Farquhar, who was a remarkable cell biologist uh, still alive. She was born in 1928. She still runs a lab and she described this particular disease, but she's also described a whole 
host of things that are involved in immune reactions, inflammatory reactions, and she's actually a pathologist. Uh, she was married to George Pallotti, who got a, a Nobel Prize for his breakthroughs in cell biology. That is a background. So the patient is a 66-year-old man with pancytopenia that arrives at the first hospital with fevers and a temperature up to 38 degrees. Um, he has a variety of other problems and hypoten orthostatic hypotension and dizziness, and he has skin lesions, and he must be pretty sick. Now, he only has 850 white cells, which would bother me as a clinician a lot, and only has 61,000 platelets, which would bother me even more. Uh, he's HIV negative, which is comforting to know. Here are a whole bunch of other laboratory values consistent with inflammatory disease. Uh, MRI was performed and imaging studies were performed. This is all three months ago before his current problem. And the results were not very re revealing. His orthostatic hypotension with volume expansion got a little better, but did not resolve. The patient, to my surprise, was discharged home. They sent this patient with a white count of 830, 850. They sent him home and instructed him to follow up with his primary care physician. Well, as you might have, and, um, Second hospitalization, he again shows up with orthostatic hypotension, and uh, this time his temperature is below normal compared to being above normal. He still looks sick, has marked edema of both legs that's unexplained, and has periorbital edema as well. Um, he's got numerous skin lesions that we aren't shown, and if we look at his laboratory values, <clears throat> um, He's got 940 white cells, and mark. And if we, uh, his peripheral smear isn't shown to us, but he has um, microcytes, macrocytes, ovalocytes, uh, polychromasia, schist schistocytes, acanthocytes, and teardrop cells. So he has a markedly abnormal peripheral smear. Uh, so finally, when he comes to MGH, he has Burr cells and schistocytes. Looks like he has sepsis or some sort of consumptive coagulopathy. Although with this marked decrease in white cell count, uh, other conditions, including malignant diseases, should occur to the physicians. Now, eventually he has a bone marrow specimen. And what we see here is that these abnormal macrophages are filled with erythrocytes. So they're performing hemophagocytosis. And uh, here's another example. Staining is a little different. Uh, here's staining for a peripheral marker. So he has hemophagocytosis. Now, he had a skin biopsy at the other hospital, and it really didn't show any evidence on skin biopsy of hemophagocytosis. And um, he uh, um, had another skin biopsy also at the other hospital, that shows uh, inflammatory changes in the dermis and subcutis, uh, but lacks specific evidence of hemophagocytosis, but a bone marrow wasn't done at the other hospital. He receives fluids and even gets cryoprecipitate and uh, uh, an antibiotic regimen is started. So the discussant considers what are the causes of hemophagocytosis? And the differential diagnosis includes microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, drug reactions with, eosinophilic, uh, with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, although we really didn't have a history of some particular kind of drug exposure that's associated with that, and also B-cell lymphomas and also T-cell disorders, including conditions that are associated with Epstein-Barr virus. So that's the differential diagnosis and the pathogenesis is shown here with antigen presenting cells initiating marked inflammatory changes in these very aggressive T cells that then signal these macrophages that begin engulfing erythrocytes and also uh, responsible for the other clinical manifestations of this not very common uh, severe inflammatory reaction. So B-cell cancers and Epstein-Barr virus infections are high on the list.
including T cell cancers, as shown here. And eventually, the hospital course and uh, the discussion goes through all this differential diagnosis, and eventually, the diagnosis of a T cell lymphoma is made that triggered this hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis syndrome. So now you've heard of that. And uh, another skin biopsy is done at MGH, and this skin biopsy shows evidence of this T cell lymphoma, which wasn't diagnosed on the other skin biopsies seen at another hospital. Now this week in the New England Journal, we have this six month old girl that presents with this anal lesion. And to be honest with you, I don't have the foggiest idea uh, what this is, although it looks fairly putrid. Uh, we're offered hemangioma, uh, hemangioma. I don't think this looks like a hemangioma. Too much inflammation and pus, and this looks like an ulcerated lesion. Imper imperforate hymen is a ridiculous differential diagnosis. This does not look like a hamartomous uh, uh, polyp, uh, and this doesn't look like a rhabdomyosarcoma that I've ever seen. But in the history, we're given two clues what this might be. The patient has an abnormal skull formation that in English is called frontal bossing. This means that the two frontal bones of the skull are particularly prominent. And here in the differential, uh, in this patient, we're also given evidence that this patient has periostitis. And both frontal bossing and periostitis are associated with congenital syphilis. I don't know what that is, but that's the only thing that would occur to me, and that indeed is the correct answer. So if we look at this thing, here's an example of frontal bossing. Now this, uh, uh, this frontal bossing is also associated with other uh, disorders, but um, it looks kind of like this and it involves abnormal formation of the frontal bones that's responsible for that. Uh, what we also see is periostitis. And this patient had periostitis of the tibia. And periostitis of the tibia is typical for congenital syphilis. This is called a a saber shin. And um, if we look at, uh, here's another, uh, here are the classical things that are associated with congenital syphilis. There are skin lesions that this infant apparently didn't have. Uh, there's periostitis of the tibias. There's this abnormal tooth formation. These are called Hutchison's teeth. This youngster was too small to have teeth. And we see this marked keratitis with clouding of the cornea, which is also typical for congenital syphilis. So, so much for that topic. Now, the paper this week in the New England Journal concerns heart failure treatment. And this is a randomized controlled trial of patients with diminished ejection fraction heart failure. In other words, they had systolic heart failure. And these patients are also receiving all the treatments that are currently indicated for systolic heart failure, ACE inhibitors or AT1 receptor blockers, beta blockers, uh, and uh, neprilysin inhibition was also given to these, uh, to these patients. And 20% of each group are still getting di digitalis. So they're all getting ideal treatment for heart failure as we understand it today. Now these patients were randomized to on top to two treatments dapagliflozin or placebo. Now dapagliflozin is a preparation that's given to patients with type two diabetes mellitus, but only 40% of the patients in this study had type two diabetes mellitus. 60% were not diabetic. So what the investigators did here is they just recruited patients with systolic heart failure, made sure that they're receiving ideal treatment, and then randomized to SGLT2 inhibition or placebo on top. Now, ordinarily, we wouldn't think that this drug would ha have any benefit for patients that don't have type 2 diabetes. So the eligibility requirements in the study were not type 2 diabetes. It was heart failure. And the patients had to have elevated pro-BNP uh, pro levels, as shown here. and um, uh, atrial fibrillation patients were also included, so the eligibility uh, criteria I've outlined here. Now, what we see here is a uh, dramatic in this table. 
the primary endpoint was clearly met. A whole variety of secondary endpoints that we'll look at in a moment were clearly met. But, and remember, 60% of these patients had no diabetes, but nevertheless, glycated hemoglobin level went down. Uh, creatinine actually went down. Uh, hematocrit uh, improved. Uh, Pro-BNP levels improved. Uh, weight went down and systolic blood pressure was reduced. So this looks pretty interesting. And if we look at the primary outcome, which was heart failure and hospitalizations for heart failure, we see an absolute, uh, a relative reduction of 26%. Now the absolute difference is about uh, uh, 4%. So the number needed to treat in this study is 20, which is fairly impressive. Uh, this is as good as the neprilysin inhibitor treatment did that was relatively recently introduced for the treatment of systolic heart failure. So, and if we look at this forest plot here of all these various subgroups, everybody got better. And they got better whether or not they had diabetes. So the patients that did not have diabetes had the same benefit from SGLT2 inhibition as did the patients that had diabetes. And that's fairly impressive. So um, this trial is going to have substantial influence on the treatment of systolic heart failure, even in the people that don't have diabetes, because the benefits from SGLT2 inhibition were at least as impressive as the benefits of neprilysin inhibition uh, that was introduced several years ago. So in English jargon, this is called a game changer, and it might. Although I think we need to keep in mind uh, that uh, SGL2 inhibitors in the United States cost $30 a tablet. So I don't know who's going to afford this. What also interested me was um, the side incomes of the investigators. And you can inspect these here. Uh, speakers engagement, travel fees, uh, uh, and all the boondoggles that the investigator got. That's slide one, here's two, uh, here's three, here's four, here's five, here's six. I don't usually show this, but I thought you needed to know. Now the next study involves dengue fever. Dengue fever is a widespread mosquito transmitted Flavivirus, which is a major disease burden throughout the world, since about 10% of these patients go into shock and die. Uh, the other patients just have break bone fever and a lot of pain, but they get better. Now, vaccines have been introduced for dengue fever, but the problem is that there are four strains of dengue fever. And um, if you're vaccinated for the wrong strain, and get bitten by a mosquito that has the other strain, you actually do worse than patients that were not vaccinated at all. And this has been sort of a dramatic problem. So this new vaccine is a tetravalent dengue vaccine that ought to do, deal with all strains. Uh, so um, this is a primary efficacy study. So there are 12,000 patients in the vaccine group and 6,000 patients in the placebo group uh, worldwide that were vaccinated, that re were tested with this tetravalent dengue virus. And uh, the endpoint population and all these tabular data are shown here, but the efficacy of the vaccine as shown in this table is 81%. Uh, and that depend uh, that's irrespective of whether or not the patients are seropositive or seronegative. Uh, so here are the protected patients and here are the placebo patients. That's pretty good, 80% efficacy, presumably against all strains. So that's a very favorable result and the safety analysis was also favorable for the vaccine group compared to the placebo group. So this is a, a part of a major trial for this new virus against dengue and uh, this looks like it's efficacious and this is going to be a winner. I was also interested in the fact that here in the disclosure statements, there were no speaker's fees and the investigators aren't 
jetted around the countries to give drug talks. Instead, one of the investigators died while the paper was being prepared. So that's shown and uh, shared authorship is also mentioned. Different kind of research, interesting. The next report in the New England Journal concerns uh, advanced non-small cell lung cancer. And this is basically, again, study looking at uh, PDL1 inhibition and uh, CTLA4 inhibition in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. We've looked at these studies before, but this is now a five-year report. So if we look at the, uh, the patients receiving conventional chemotherapy against patients receiving these antibiotics, we see still lethal disease, but the patients that get PDL1, uh, PD1 ligand inhibition and CTLA4 inhibition do better than the patients that receive conventional therapy. So at uh, four years out, uh, there are substantially more patients remaining alive in this group compared to that group. And if we look at this forest plot, Interestingly enough, the patients that have never smoked uh, seem to do worse than the patients that smoked. I have no idea why that would be the case. Uh, but overall survival, better with this uh, double antibody treatment compared to conventional chemotherapy. Uh, and um, uh, that is better in all the patients as well as in the patients that have differing levels of PDL, uh, PDL1 expression. And uh, that's also shown in this forest plot. So this looks like it's going to be the standard tr treatment for patients that have non-small cell lung cancer. This is a four year, almost five year follow up in these patients. Now the next study in the New England Journal involves <coughs> prophylaxis after percutaneous intervention. And uh, usually these patients are, receive a P2Y12 inhibition and together with aspirin. So the question that was asked in this trial was, would ticagrelor alone uh, be safer than giving the patients ticagrelor plus aspirin? So the endpoint here, the primary endpoint here is a bleeding endpoint. And uh, the other endpoint, of course, is, is the protection from additional adverse cardio cardiovascular events as good with the monotherapy compared to the combination therapy. So this p-value here, which is supports, which is immediately a little confusing, but the p-value indicates non-inferiority of the ticagrelor alone treatment compared to the ticagrelor plus aspirin treatment in terms of protection, protecting from adverse cardiovascular events. And there was a little less bleeding in the patients that got the single regimen, and that's shown here. So uh, first of all, in adverse cardiovascular events, no difference. If we expand the scale, absolutely no difference. Uh, but there was a little less bleeding in the monotherapy group Ticagrelor alone group compared to the ticagrelor plus aspirin group. So that was the result of that trial. Then in the New England Journal, I was interested in this. Concerns stool transplant, which is all the rage nowadays, um, sort of a uh, pretty good data that this helps patients that have resistant Clostridium difficile infection. But it's now being introduced for all sorts of other things. So in this brief report in the New England Journal, um, learned how, how did they make the, this transplant uh, uh, material. Uh, this donor stool was liquefied in a blender, and then it's moved through a sieve, and then it's packaged into methyl cellulose and acid-resistant capsules, Well, you've seen all that. Well, in these two concomitant clinical trials, uh, this stool transplantation was not performed in patients with severe Clostridium difficile. Uh, this was performed for other reasons. And patient number one actually has um, terminal liver disease and has hepatic encephalopathy. And patient number two has myelodysplastic 
syndrome. It didn't occur to me immediately why, why he needed a stool transplant. This patient died because it turns out that this stool transplant donor had a fairly aggressive strain of E. coli in his stool that then resulted in sepsis in these patients. So these both of these patients had positive blood cultures. So if we look at the donor's stool and the resistance patterns of his Arishia, he had a extended spectrum beta lactamase producing Escherichia coli. It's very similar to the what was then cultured in the blood from these two patients and then molecular genetics was done to show that these strains were the same. And then the investigators looked at other patients that got uh, this uh, uh, ESBL uh, Escherichia coli and uh, this organism also showed up in other patients that did not get septic, septic from this condition. Whether or not this result will uh, attenuate the enthusiasm for stool transplant, not allowed to call that anymore, this is not politically correct. This treatment is now called fecal microbiota transplantation. Please put that in your memory bank. Fecal microbiota transplantation, FMT. So much for that. This patient in the New England Journal, in the first sentence of this report, we know what he has. So this is a 34-year-old patient that suddenly develops painful swallowing and has white plaques in his mouth. So this looks like Candida albicans, um, or we call this thrush when it occurs in children and when this occurs in adults nowadays they have to be immunosuppressed and it's very common in patients with AIDS. So this patient probably has AIDS and he also he gets short of breath and he gets hypoxemic and various other things uh, because um, the investigators apparently weren't immediately aware that he, uh, he might have AIDS. So in his history uh, he's from the United States but once in his life he traveled to northern Africa. He had 20 previous sexual partners involving both men and women and used condoms inconsistently. Interestingly enough, he also has skin lesions. Uh, and what he has is uh, macules with violaceous plaque macules with irregular borders present on his lower extremities. So he's tested for HIV and he's positive. Because he's short of breath, um, x-ray is done and actually this chest x-ray and that's all we had to go on when I was dealing with such patients is rather difficult to interpret and exactly what these arrows here are supposed to indicate I'm not certain but if we look at the CT examination we can see that he has marked consolidation of both lung fields that's not that obvious on the plain film cardiac silhouette is all and that's a little vague here uh, but it's actually fairly well delineated on both sides and costophrenic angles also look okay. But this CT is grossly abnormal. And when these patients are hypoxemic, they almost invariably have pneumocystis. And this patient had pneumocystis. And then the discussion is what subsequently happens to this patient because he has abdominal pain that then gets worse. And the discussant considers a broad differential diagnosis, including what he might have gotten on his trip to North Africa and uh, what sort of risk factors he might have for having been born in the southwestern United States. And basically, this case report is important because it gives us an overview of all of the things that these poor AIDS patients develop, including tuberculosis and histoplasmosis and Mycobacterium avium complex, atypical tuberculosis, and cryptosporidiosis, which is common and also consistent with abdominal pain, aspergillosis, and then the violaceous plaques that we ought to consider and look at very carefully because they could certainly represent Kaposi's sarcoma, which is caused by herpes virus 8, and I hope you know that. And there's also a differential diagnosis for uh, violaceous plaques, but I would think that patients with Bartonella henselii might have some funny looking lymph nodes. So if we look at the violaceous plaques, they're shown here 
And I think on an initial physical examination, these kinds of plaques might well be missed, uh, but they were diac uh, they were biopsied, and these plaques revealed the presence of herpes virus 8, which is consistent with Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, Kaposi was a, a Viennese physician that described five patients in 1872 uh, that didn't have AIDS, but nowadays this skin condition, this malignant skin disease, uh, is almost invariably associated with HIV infection. So this patient then undergoes endoscopy and he's got these lesions in his gastrointestinal tract and they're biopsied and they're also Kaposi's sarcoma. That is a question, what do we do with this patient? Well, the most important thing is to treat his AIDS and get his CD4 count um, to a point where it's consistent with survival. That was done. Then the Kaposi's sarcoma may get better on its own. And if it does not, a specific chemotherapy is indicated. In the Lancet, two weeks of Lancet, in this Danish study, and they have excellent computerized medical records, the question was asked, is having a mental illness associated with premature mortality, aside from suicide and accidents? Well, I would think it probably would be. Uh, so this hypothesis was tested in over 7 million people that were included in this analysis. And this is a broad spectrum of psychiatric disorders, not just depression, but also schizophrenia, uh, drug use disorders, eating disorders, personality disorders, intellectual disabilities, uh, behavioral problems, et cetera, broad gamut. And you can look at these graphs on your own. And this is uh, these graphs are plotted over increasing age. Now, if the patients reach 95 years of age, there's no longer a difference, but otherwise there's always a higher mortality in persons with some sort of psychiatric disturbance compared to the general population. And um, breakdown on, a, and whether, whether it's neoplasms, infectious disease, diabetes, circulatory disorders, these causes of death are all more common in persons that have an underlying mental illness compared to the general population. What we also see in the second study here in the New England, in the Lancet, is the comparative effectiveness and safety of first line antihypertensive drugs. And this is an evaluation of 5 million hypertensive patients in nine different countries where investigators looked at what drugs they were getting, the quality of their blood pressure control, <clears throat> in order to get an idea of which medications are really the best. And this, this is not a randomized trial, of course, this is a survey study, a registry study, if you will. And the drugs are hydrochlorothiazides or hydrochlorothiazide-like drugs. Chlorothaladone, for instance, and dapamide or hydrochlorothiazide like drugs. Then a whole host of different ACE inhibitors and a whole palette of, anti, of AT1 receptor blockers and uh, dihydropyridine calcium antagonists and non dihydropyridine calcium antagonists. These are spread across all these 5 million patients. Now, hypertension is a disease of middle age and the elderly. So of course, uh, these age groups are primarily involved. And if we look at this comprehensive study, here they are, uh, relative risk reduction. What we see here is that the thiazides and the thiazide-like diuretics beat all the other drugs in terms of reducing risk, uh, irrespective of age, and if we look at, uh, you can look at, go through these graphical displays on your own, uh, but the thiazide-like drugs and the thiazide diuretics seem to beat the other drugs independent of blood pressure lowering. And uh, all of course, uh, this is a meta-analytic safety profile. And uh, aside from hypokalemia, uh, which looks better in the patients getting ACE inhibitors, thiazides are well tolerated. And ARBs, the hypokalemia shows up again, uh, and the calcium antagonists 
Aside from these issues, and stage renal disease may be a problem, aside from these issues, hydrochlorothiazide and thiazide-like drugs are very well tolerated across all age groups and seem to reduce risk perhaps better than the other drugs, which implicates perhaps that we should be considering more use of thiazide-like drugs instead of following the NICE recommendations where ACE inhibitors and ARBs are given to the younger patients and more commonly to Caucasian patients. Uh, the thiazide and thiazide-like drugs seem to work well for everybody, and that's what this survey seemed to show. Then in the Lancet, here was this patient with trigeminal neuralgia, also called tic douloureux. And this condition is highly associated with a looping structure of the anterior cerebra, uh, cerebellar artery and the gasserian ganglion. And this condition can be operatively treated as this little case reports indicates to alleviate this severe form of facial tick-like pain. Then in the Lancet this week, here's another study of uh, uh, PDL1 um, uh, inhibition in patients with metastatic head and neck cancers compared to an antibody directed against epidermal growth factor receptor. And uh, here are the patients, and they have a whole host of various hosts of um, head and neck cancers, and they're randomized to these two treatments. And what we see here is that the PDL1 inhibitors do better than the epidermal growth factor receptor antibody. Perhaps the two drugs should be given together uh, since the overall survival in these patients at uh, 40 months uh, in the more advantageous group was only 40% compared to 15%, but perhaps these patients would have preferred to have an even better outcome. So that was, that's that study. Not great differences, but there are, the PDL1 inhibitor antibody does better. In the next study, uh, we finally consider instead of always non-small cell lung cancer, here's a look at small cell lung cancer. And uh, these patients were also randomized to a checkpoint inhibitor strategy. That's what this antibody does compared to conventional chemotherapy with a toposide. And here are the patients, smaller number, Apparently this tumor is not quite as common as it used to be. There's 62 patients in the antibody group and 63 patients in the conventional chemotherapy group. But if we look at this, again, PDL1 inhibition uh, seems to offer these patients an improvement in overall survival. That's statistically significant and also progression-free survival. And uh, Side effects, yes, but uh, survival, better. And the side effects seem to be tolerable. The review in the Lancet is important for nephrologists because it's on acute kidney injury. And it's quite comprehensive and it goes on to historical and mechanistic aspects and uh, common problem in hospitalized patients, particularly after cardiac surgery or patients having shock or end stage. And a lot of these patients then move on to end stage renal disease. And this is the clinical spectrum of acute kidney injury and uh, how to stage these patients in terms of increasing creatinine and whether or not they're oliguric and uh, all of this is shown here. And uh, this is a worldwide problem and the incidence of acute kidney injury in hospitalized patients is fairly consistent across the world in countries that care to report these kinds of data. And um, the causes and pathophysiological mechanisms, we've discussed these before, but this is mostly an operative associated problem. And uh, there are markers for this NGAL and kidney injury molecule, and uh, we've even 
talked about um, Dikov three as a potential marker, and then uh, the continuous spectrum, lots of nice pictures. So if you're involved in these, if you take care of sick patients in the hospital, you should have a look at this and um, see if we can do anything about it. That seems to be a problem, estimating optimal fluid balance, still a clinical problem, and um, a lot of work needs to be done here. Then I wanted to show you two important studies that were in science. And this, this first study involves measles vaccine compared to patients that aren't vaccinated. And these investigators found a religious group that refused to be vaccinated and studied their children, some of whom developed measles. And the children that developed measles develop a loss of immunological memory against other conditions, whether they're vaccinated or not. So the presence of acute measles infection is immunosuppressive, an effect that seems to be prolonged. And that was shown in that study. Another good reason to be vaccinated and then you don't have that problem. Then I was also interested in this. Since total genome sequencing now costs $1,000 a patient instead of a, million, a billion dollars a patient, uh, total genome sequencing is now commonly done. And apparently burial grounds in uh, Republican and Imperial Rome were found and they sequenced all these patients in Republican and Imperial Rome to find out where the people had come from. And they came from all over. And so you can tell from the sequences here what sort of genomes the inhabitants of ancient Rome had, and they're hardly different than today. And the last patient in the Lancet involved this pregnant woman who has fibroid tumors. And during pregnancy, fibroid tumors can increase remarkably in size. So this fibroid tumor that she has ended up being almost as large as the fetus. Here's the tumor and here's the fetus. And this condition is called red degeneration in uterine fibroids that complicate pregnancy. So that's what these look like. So you might have a look at that. So thank you for your attention. And next week, we'll go back to just doing one week at a time. And if you'd like to hear this tedious message in German, you can stick around because in eight more minutes, we'll do it all again.